welcome everyone. Um, this is the first in a new webinar series being hosted by the BC Agricultural Climate Adaptation Research Network. Uh, we have quite a few people already uh, that have already joined us. Um, we had almost 200 registrants for this webinar, which is uh, fantastic. So I think we're gonna just get underway right on time here. Um, so as I mentioned, this is our, the first series in uh, the first session in our new series. And this is actually the first webinar series that ACARN has hosted. Um, like many organizations, we will be doing uh, many more of these types of uh, webinars for discussion and sharing research and tools. So thanks for joining us today um, as we test out this new format um, and uh, bear with us if there's any technical glitches. Uh, I'm Shauna McKinnon, I'm the coordinator for ACARN, and it's a pleasure to be co-hosting this webinar today with Kari Tyler from the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium. And then we also have three panelists joining us who I will introduce in just a moment. Um, I just wanna give a quick introduction before we get started to ACARN and also to um, why weather and climate data is so important to adaptation. ACARN is a, a network that formed four years ago around the need to increase collaboration across institutions and across disciplines um, to address the challenges with climate change adaptation in agriculture. Collaboration as a way to increase the sharing of resources and expertise across the province. ACARN is unique in that it brings together government, industry, and academic researchers. And there's 10 institutions that are represented on the ACARN steering committee and it's that steering committee that guides both the work and the direction of the network. Along with the steering committee, there are over 100 ACARD members across the province who are working in agricultural adaptation uh, from research to policy, programming, extension. And um, many of these members became involved in ACARN through our events and projects that have been delivered over the past four years. One of the key areas of common interest in ACARN is the need for weather and climate data to inform agricultural adaptation. And I imagine that all of you have joined today because you are well aware of how necessary this data is to climate change adaptation in agriculture. As the climate has changed, we're experiencing a shift in climatic conditions. So those general warming trends, um, shifts in precipitation patterns, but at the same time, we're also experiencing less predictable weather. So unseasonal highs and lows in temperature, um, more extreme weather events like wind storms and ice storms and intense rainfall. All of this of course has a huge impact on agriculture because the crops we grow um, evolved with a stable climate. So agriculture is already being impacted by climate change and those impacts will continue and continue to change as we move forward into the future. Um, the, the ways that agriculture is impacted is numerous and affects everything from pest management to um, drainage, irrigation, and finding ways to um, protect against those unseasonal extremes and um, extreme events. Given that um, agricultural and climate weather data is essential for adaptation and really underpins research across all institutions and disciplines, um, ACARN was motivated to, to um, host this webinar series where we're, um, our intent is to provide guided tours of the data and tools that are available for climate and weather data. And this gives us a chance uh, to present to you the experts who are involved closely with these with these tools and data sets, and in some cases, the people that develop them. So this is a great opportunity to hear directly from them how to use, um, use these tools and for you to be able to ask your questions right to the experts. Uh, the first of the two webinars in the series are taking place this June. And uh, the, the, so there's today's presentation and then the next one coming up is going to focus on climate modeling analysis tools. Um, with two tools developed by the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium. And then again in the fall, we will have uh, several more se uh, sessions focusing on national climate data portals, some global tools, as well as um, uh, farm level management tools that have been developed. So for today, we will be taking a deep dive into three sources of weather and climate data for BC. 
We have Stephanie Tam from the BC Ministry of Agriculture joining us, who will be presenting on Farm West Weather Station Network and the farm management calculators that they, um, that they offer. Then we'll have Farron Anslow from the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium, who will be presenting on PRISM, uh, gridded historical temperature and precipitation data. And then Aurelia Schoenberg, also from the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium, will be presenting on hydrological model outputs for the Peace, Fraser, and Columbia watersheds. After each of the presenters, we will have a Q&A uh, period that Takari will be facilitating. Um, our presenters and uh, hosts are joining us from their homes, so I, there could be some unexpected interruptions. Um, uh, just thank you in advance for your patience and good humor in, in case there are some unexpected interruptions. Um, and now before our first speaker begins, I'm gonna pass the mic to Kari, um, who has uh, some questions for you and yeah, go ahead, Kari. All right, so I've launched the first poll that we'll be asking um, folks. We'll be using polling within uh, the Zoom software here. Um, and I see <clears throat> many of you have voted already. This is really just a warm up to um, get a sense of, of how often you use uh, weather and climate data. So I'll give you just a couple of seconds more to, to vote on that one and then there is a follow up poll. Uh, a couple of things I just wanted to mention about how the engagement with the webinar is working. Um, there's a chat function if you have um, sort of chatting or technical issues. Um, um, want to give us all just like thumbs up for the great job that we're doing feel free to just add that in the chat um, We have a Q&A though as well And that's something um, that has a feature that allows you to upvote questions that you think are important or, or that you want answered um, As you see something that someone else has put forward uh, not a popularity contest though so um, but please do as you have questions for the presenters please use the Q&A function in zoom and I'll be monitoring that and the chat box as um, as these presentations go forward so I'm just going to end this first poll and we can see the results so um, it looks like we've got sort of this sort of healthy split of you know, most people here are using climate and weather data to inform their work, and there's a good sort of just spread of how often that is being used. Um, I have another poll before we get going about how you're using climate and weather data, so I'll give you a couple of seconds to fill that one out. Um, and then there's a couple of people, there's people still sort of just trickling in, which is wonderful. Uh, I'm just going to repeat, all the participants are muted and uh, we're going to be using the chat for sort of technical issues um, and then uh, questions for presenters. We'd really like you to put through the Q&A feature and I can put, um, I, I can provide some nudges for that as well as we're, as we're going through. All right, um, vote fast. I'm gonna close this poll in the next 10 seconds. And, well, I'm not even gonna give it 10 seconds. So I think most people have voted, but still not everybody. Um, so hopefully everyone is able to see the polls. Please do send me a message in the chat if you're not able to see the poll function. So here we go, I'll end the polling and share the results. So for this one, can everybody see the results? Um, shared on their screens because okay good all right and with that I will hand this over to Stephanie for the first presentation thank you so much and I'm gonna go share my screen Everybody see the first slide at all? That looks good. Perfect. So um, I'm the water management engineer at the Ministry of Agriculture in the Abbotsford office. And I've been advocating for weather stations as part of my job since I joined the ministry about 16 years ago. 
And for this webinar, uh, we received a number of questions during the online registration process, and some of the questions are related to weather stations. So I've tried my best to integrate some of those answers in my presentation. And if there are still outstanding questions, please feel free to bring them up at the end of the presentation. Okay. So <clears throat> we know that uh, farmers grow food for all of us and whether information tells them how to run their farms every day. Food security, we all know that is a hot topic these days. And if we want to improve food security, then we need to provide an easy access to weather information to the farmers. And that's why back in 2001, almost 20 years ago, our ministry developed the farmwest.com website with our partners to provide real-time <clears throat> forecast weather information for free for farmers to help them make informed decisions. And the partners that we have are the Pacific Field Corn Association, Agriculture Agri Food Canada, and Irrigation Association BC. And as you can see on this slide here, Farm West is connected to stations in every province and territory across the province. On this slide here, you're looking at the southern portion of BC, broken down into regions. And you can see also parts of Alberta here. We have a total of over 400 stations from the federal, provincial, municipal, and private weather station networks. And within that, we have over 150 stations located in BC that uh, includes 45 agricultural stations. And the dots that you see on the map here are not the only stations available in the province. Some stations are <clears throat> high up in the mountains for avalanche purposes, for example, where there are no agricultural activities. And those stations will have very different data from the stations where they are close to the farmlands at the valley bottom. And so stations up in the mountain are not very useful for farmers. And so this, we, we selected for Farm West the stations that are on or close to agricultural lands to make sure that the stations are giving farmers the data that are representative of the conditions on their farm. And so those are the dots that you see on the map here. So at the bottom here, the station legend, you can see that there are many weather stations that are connected to Farm West right now, and each of them operate on their own. For example, Ministry of Transportation has a network of, uh, for Avalanche. And those different networks appear as different colors of dots on the map. Each of these networks, they have their own data processing protocol, station repair maintenance procedures, and citing specifications. And some of, some of these networks have stations within very close proximity from each other. For example, Environment Canada has a station in Abbotsford Airport, and so has Metro Vancouver. They could be as close as you know, 100 meters apart. And so to streamline all these provincial networks, in 2010, Ministry of Environment initiated a program called Climate Related Monitoring Program, CRMP. Our Ministry of Agriculture is a partner, and the intent of the program is really to integrate all existing provincial networks into one so that we can share all this long-term climate data in the province for free. And what we're thinking of for the program is that we could have standardized QAQC protocol, citing and classification system, having a central portal to house the data, do QAQC and make it available for everyone in, in, in some sort of web portal. And we could also have a dedicated team to do field work, repair maintenance for all the stations. And like I said earlier, if there are some dupl duplicate stations within very close proximity, we can um, decommission one of them and reallocate those resources to areas where we need more coverage. So 
in a nutshell, the CRMP initiative is not here to change the existing operations of any one of our partners. And it's not about gathering like-minded people together just for the sake of collaboration. It is really intended to maximize the data sharing power and also uh, gain some efficiencies through the process. And here I have um, um, the list of partners that are involved in the CRMP program. And you can look through the details on our province website. So we have Ministry of Agriculture um, through the farmwest.com website. We have Ministry of Environment, No Pillow, River Forecast, Aquarius, Flimro, we have Fire Management, Forest Ecosystem Research, Transportation Avalanche. From the federal government, we have Environment Canada, um, private stations like Rio Tinto Alcan, that is a private company uh, focusing on aluminum. Also, we have BC Hydro, Metro Vancouver, Capital Regional District. Metro Vancouver and Capital Regional District are the newer partners we have uh, since a year or two ago. And last but not least is the Pacific Climate Impact Consortium, PCAC. And since we have uh, PCAC as uh, one of the partners, um, we're really happy to have them. And that's because of their expertise in BC and Yukon regions. When it comes to climate monitoring analysis and projections, they are the experts. And they are there to provide the advice on climate change topics for agriculture researchers that are outside the realm of Farm West. And as you can see on the slide here, PCIC is already providing data for public use through their data portal. And the data sharing hub for CRMP program could look something like this, but we don't know yet. So we're pretty um, early in the process of the CRMP initiative. And another reason why we're not quite there yet with the CRMP program um, is that the CRMP program is part of a bigger initiative in the federal or at the federal um, level. Environment and Climate Change Canada, they have an initiative called Network of Networks. And that's linked to the CRMP because our province is part of the provincial initiative. So the, the provincial, sorry, the federal government is committed to this initiative for 10 years. And what we're trying to do here as a country is to enhance the access, the exchange of quality data, weather data in a province, and really for the benefits of all Canadians across the country. And so the federal government is working with all the provinces and territories to move this initiative forward to support climate change, severe weather conditions, and so forth. It is, I would say, I have to stress on this, it is voluntary for, pro for all the provinces and territories to participate in this federal program. And right now, BC and Ontario are the two provinces that are going ahead with the pilot phase of this um, Network of Networks initiative. Phase one, we have for BC, FLIMRO, Ministry of Environment and Transportation participating. And phase two for BC, we will be including Ministry of Agriculture, but it probably won't start until a couple years from now, 2022 at the earliest. And I would like to stress on this point here. Whatever we do as a province or within the agricultural community, we really should look at the overall provincial or federal initiative we really have to keep that in mind that there are provincial and federal initiatives in place to manage weather data for the province, for the country. And for everything that we do going forward, it will be really nice to have everybody heading in the same direction together. So just keep that in mind. 
Aside from um, a bunch of decision support tools that's hosted on FarmWest, I'll demonstrate that in a bit. Um, the climate data the, or the weather data that we collected from all these weather stations has been used in a number of applications for agriculture, particularly for these um, three web tools that we have um, listed on the slide here. First one is agriculture irrigation scheduling calculator that incorporate climate data and forecast data um, into the tool for helping farmers how to schedule the irrigation on a daily basis. Next one is the agriculture water demand model. We use crop irrigation systems, soil and climate data, historical climate data, and also projected future climate data to calculate how much water we need for agriculture uh, now and into the future. And that's really to the most important piece for the agriculture water demand model is really to reserve water for agriculture. And the third number, uh, the third item is the BCA culture water calculator. We've developed that uh, partner, partnering with Ministry of Environment and FLIMRO to support groundwater licensing. But the tool can also be used for licensing uh, for surface water use as well. And that calculator has been really widely used by farmers when they submit their applications for water licensing and also from uh, Minister Forrest who uh, assess the applications and issue licenses as well. So that's been going very well. Now we are going to, oops, sorry, we're going to have a demo of FarmWest. Okay, so here's the farmwest.com website. And on the right hand side, you can see a bunch of decision A tools that's based on weather data that we collected every day. The one that I focus on is evapotranspiration because that is uh, my specialty water irrigation. So if you click on the evapotranspiration tab, or you open up right here just for um, saving time. We have tabs here that you can choose the station uh, from a map. So if we click on station map, the map of Canada is um, automatically shown here. And if you zoom in, you see all the station appear in the BC um, boundary and also Alberta across to the east side of the country. So if we go back to BC and let's say, well, since my office is in Abbotsford, I'll pick the Abbotsford station. And here it is. And I'll say, select the station. That will automatically populate Abbotsford airport here. And you can also, use the drop down menu to pick your province, regions, and the stations. On the right hand side, that's the um, date range that you can select. So here I have June 1st to June the 9th, 2020. And you can go back in time to all the way 1970 to pick the historical information. So in this case, I just pick June 1st to 9th of this year, and I press the go button. This is the data, if I can um, maybe zoom in a little bit. The evapotranspiration is 28 total, 28 millimeters total for the time range that we've selected. And on average is 3.1. And we also have the forecast ET based on the forecast information coming from Environment Canada. Effective precipitation here, it means if we have rainfall, we're going to take out the first five millimeters because the first five millimeters is almost insignificant. It's like little drizzles. And the rest of it, if it takes 75% of the remaining of the precipitation, is what we call the effective precipitation that will have a significant effect on irrigation or on the 
moisture of in the soil and plants. And the difference, uh, the, the difference of evapotranspiration and effective precipitation will be what we call moisture deficit. Moisture deficit is the amount of water that we lost through the plants and soil surfaces. And that's the amount that you need to put back into the soil through irrigation. And that's how you find out when you need to put in um, more water through your irrigation system. And at the bottom, oh, uh, looks like it's circling for um, a graph for evapotranspiration and precipitation. Not sure, I think it must be my uh, internet surface here. But anyways, there are two maps at the bottom, sorry, not maps, but graphs that shows you the ET and the precipitation um, during that time period. It's a very simple graph that show you graphically versus uh, numerical in a table. And if, if people are interested to see the daily data, they can click on this tab. And we've got T-min, T-max, evapotranspiration, precipitation, and moisture deficit in a table. One of the questions that came from the, um, the audience prior to this webinar was about the temperature or other parameters that we collect. So the temperature here are the air temperature. And we do not have parameters like soil temperature, soil moisture, or leaf wetness, because those are more farm specific or actually site specific data that are only useful for that particular farm. And if we post it on the web, it's really not useful for others to see, and it could really be confusing for the neighbors. Now that's what's happening in Joe's farm, but not in my farm, right? So it's just giving, um, not representative information um, for others to use. So we don't publish that and we also don't collect it either because of privacy issues. And now moving along to other decision aid tools we have, for example, growing degree days. Let's take a little to grow. It looks like it's still circling. Um, while it loads up, if it does later, uh, the growing degree days originally we have the base temperature set to zero degrees Celsius. And there are some researchers who ask for base temperature below zero. And so we expanded the selection to minus five. And we have other calculators like the pest degree days. And I think uh, some people were asking about it. Oh, here we go, growing degree days. So base temperature, we have all the way to minus five. And now about the pest degree days, in the drop down menu, you could see when it loads up, you could see a bunch of different types of pests that you can pick from. And the Daily results are posted here because FarmWest really are interested in the daily data set rather than the hourly data set. The pest degree day tool has been pretty widely used by the Store Out Insect Release Program in the Okanagan, fairly regularly. And it is very different from the DAS program. Uh, some, some questions from the uh, participants here, they ask about the DAS program, which is decision aid system that the Okanagan and Sural Insect Release Program have developed in partnership with Washington State University. That model, the DAS system is very sophisticated <clears throat> and it is run on an annual subscription. That's something really outside the capacity of Farm West in terms of operational, technical and financial perspective. And I'll let others talk about the DAS project if uh, people are interested. Um, the, this is out of my expertise, obviously. And the DAS project uses 15 minute data set versus Farm West Pest Degree Days. We use hourly data, uh, sorry, um, daily data set. 
there are a bunch of other tools uh, for the interest of time. I'm not going to demonstrate every one of them, but obviously if you would like to, uh, I can speak to individuals um, at a later time after the presentation. So that is pretty much uh, Farm West here. If I could go back to the presentation to just wrap this up. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, we do have some great questions coming through the Q&A, so yeah. should we shift to that now? Uh, Kari, do you want to? Yeah, I'm going to launch the poll while, while we do that. Sorry, Stephanie, do you have, you have a last slide? Is it yeah, I do have a last slide, okay. but I will, I'll go really quickly here. Okay. There we go. So just want to wrap this up. Uh, FarmWest is really a portal for farmers. It's really for farmers with, uh, to help with the daily farm operation. And the focus for FarmWest is to host these specific decision aid tools, like those I've shown you on the website earlier. Other organizations and websites specialize in their, uh, uh, let's say climate data projection into the next 50, 100 years, for example, like peak cake, because they are the experts in those areas. I'm not, and farmers is not either. So some regions, um, either local farm groups or local government have their own dedicated independent website to host information that targets specific needs for the region. For example, the grain producers in the Peace region, uh, local governments like Metro Vancouver. It would be otherwise really challenging from a financial and operational perspective if any one organization has to take on all the pieces into a single website for the province. And I really appreciate every organization doing their share uh, with a particular expertise and get the work done within their individual group or region. And that gives a lot of flexibility to host those information for specific needs that uh, can be hosted on the independent website. And when need be, for example, data sharing, uh, that's when collaboration happens, really like that. And that's when the climate related monitoring program, CRMP, is all about. It's about data sharing, it's about gaining some efficiency, and yet keeping each network to continue to operate on their own and have flexibility to make the changes if necessary. So, yeah, that's my conclusion for the presentation. Sorry, it took a little bit longer than I thought. Great, thank you, Stephanie. So we do have some questions for you, um, and I'll get to those. The one that has been asked the most right now is will an API be added to the portal to allow the data to be downloaded by scripts? Uh, that I'm not sure, this is, uh, it probably could be, but um, it will have to be looked at down the road, but I'll make a note of that. Okay, and also some people are wondering about adding weather stations to the provincial network if they have weather stations that they wanted to add. Um, is that something that you were looking at or do you use other people's, um, like how would that happen? Is that something people could ask you about? Yeah, definitely. We're always looking for partners and if you want to have your stations added to Farm West, just give me a shot. Okay, perfect. Um, and we've got your contact information as part of the, the, the whole presentation here. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I also question about whether the data is adjusted if weather stations have technical issues. Is there the quality control on the weather stations as part of this? Yep. For now, uh, the quality control protocol is me manually doing it. <laughs> but we are working on a more uh, uh, standardized QAQC protocol and that will be coming soon in the next year or two. Okay. Um, and um, so there's somebody had a question about becoming a member to Farm West. Uh, is there a membership or is it that this feels like it's a, the data is all available online? Yeah, it is all available online, but if you want to have um, um, updates on certain things, then you could sign up as a member. It's free. It's free. Perfect. Yeah. Um, 
so I'm going also, um, there's a, just a question about polling data. I think that was sort of addressed by the API. Um, there's a question about the relationship between BC Agriculture Pacific Field Corn Association and Farm West. Um, just to clarify the, the relationship between those. Yeah, so Farm West is owned by Pacific Field Corn Association. Um, there are a few components within Farm West. One of them is the weather station network, and the other component is more of the research side that Agriculture Agri-Food Canada looks after and uh, with a strong focus on corn trials. So that's the linkage. We, we just need to, to partner with some uh, farm organizations at that, that time, that was the right fit. Right. That's 2001. Okay, um, other another question about any known users of this data within Northern BC. Um, are there other egg weather station networks in that region that aren't included? Um, well, if they are part of the provincial network with uh, Ministry of Forest or Ministry of Transportation or uh, the federal network, Environment Canada, then we will have them. Uh, only though, the only catch is that if they are close to agricultural areas. If not, then we would not have them on Farm West. And if anyone who could identify something that we've missed, uh, a station up north or any areas in the province, please let me know and I will try to find those areas or try to find those stations and hook them up to Farm West. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there so we have enough time for all the, um, the other presentations, but the, if we've got time at the end, there's a couple of questions that we didn't get to and I may loop back around to those. Sounds good, so. thank you. All right, thanks everyone. So now this is Farron um, for his presentation. Shall I go ahead and take the take the screen? Go ahead, yeah. please share your screen. While you're just doing that, I'll mention that um, because we have a um, we will be recording what all the Q and A questions were. If there were, if you did have a question that wasn't answered, we can follow up and make sure it gets answered after the webinar. So please do keep putting your questions up there. All right. Um, yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks Stephanie for introducing um, a lot of stuff that. I hoped you'd introduce, so I didn't have to do it. Uh, that's great. And uh, thanks everyone for attending. It's um, it's good to be back as part of ACARN. I uh, attended a couple years ago, uh, one of the workshops and really enjoyed engaging with the agricultural community. So <clears throat> I'm glad to uh, present some of the stuff that we're working on here at PKIC. Um, yeah, so as was mentioned, um, I'm kind of focused on the recent and historical climate data. Um, the coming webinars and it really is um, presentation is going to focus on some of the future impacts, uh, but I'll kind of give you some information on the data that we have that is related to current data, the historical data. Um, I'm going to give you a real quick introduction to PKIC in case you're not familiar. Um, so we're, um, we're a not-for-profit associated with University of Victoria. Um, or partly funded through an endowment and partly through various contracts. And I put up here the hierarchy of kind of um, how we're constructed. Um, so we've got a board of directors um, and then we have, you know, the director and operations persons. And then beneath that, there's three different themes um, that do the active uh, climate research. So my theme is climate analysis and monitoring. Um, we have regional climate impacts and hydrological impacts. Um, and Aurelia will talk about hydrological impacts. And then underneath all that, we also have a fairly large number of postdoctoral and graduate research persons um, who you know, kind of do more um, kind of cutting edge science and they're getting published in major uh, journals. 
uh, but that kind of gives us this really strong base uh, for doing the analysis that we do. So it kind of keeps our, our work and research really relevant. And the very foundation and extremely important uh, part of us is the computational support theme. Um, and they basically do all the, um, you know, data portal um, coding to our computational infrastructure, um, basically everything that you see on the web um, is coming from them. And, you know, without them, uh, we couldn't, couldn't do what we do. Um, I can't remember the exact number of us there are now, but we're above 20 people, um, somewhere in that neighborhood. Let's flip through our, our service objectives are to provide uh, enable analysis of the impacts of climate variability and change um, on regional climate and water resources. Um, stuff that's really relevant to, to the agricultural um, group here. Uh, we you know, enable interpretation of climate information um, enable the use of recent data as well as future climate projections. Uh, we work to build partnerships um, that enable this delivery. So, you know, we do some work um, out of our endowment, but we also do a lot of work working with uh, various partners. And we aim to put together projects that will help the partner out, but also um, help the whole province of BC. Um, and kind of more and more we're doing work that spans the the nation here so uh, we try to kind of leverage uh, the funding in that way um yeah and the service delivery um so again more <laughs> more data portals um so we have public openly accessible uh, data portals we do direct delivery to stakeholders um usually through you know supports or various web tools um, sorry, reports, various web tools. Um, we do a spectrum of user training and engagement activities. Um, CARI is a key component of that. Um, and yeah, the publication of reports as well. So my theme is, is the one that deals with the kind of historical aspect. Um, basically focus on the current analysis of recent and historical weather records in BC. And outside of the, and so this is directly engaged with the climate related monitoring program that Stephanie talked about um, through that program. Um, this very large archive of climate data was created and handed over to PKIC. And then we've continued to build on that data set by taking in data um, in near real time. So um, Stephanie mentioned there's about 400 stations that she tracks and um, there's about something similar uh, number of stations that we get data from on an hourly basis and then a slightly smaller set of data another 300 um, that we get data from on a, a less regular basis but is considered up to date. Uh, we also work with Yukon Northwest Territories um, and Alberta um, just because they are are on our border. Um, well, not just because they're on our border, but they're also, they're nice people down there, over there. Um, <laughs> and then we use that data to create added value products. Um, so quality controlled homogenized data, um, do monthly seasonal weather analysis, analysis of trends, um, various climate indicators, and a depiction of the long-term climatology of BC. So I decided to base this uh, presentation on the questions. Um, so when you registered, I think some of the issues that you wanted to have addressed were, um, there's a field for you to enter what those, those questions or issues were. Um, and I had a look at those and kind of broke them down into three areas um, that apply to the CAM theme. Um, so those areas are data access, uh, data processing, and then finding answers from that data. So I'm gonna kind of walk through our our tools with those three things in mind. Um, so these are some of the questions that we saw. Um, and again, I think we saw a couple of them again um, after Stephanie's talk. Um, so access and location of weather stations. Um, really good question about encouraging open data practices, um, basically ensuring that data gets distributed. Um, 
that's one I can't touch on necessarily, but it's, you know, it's part of what the CRIMP works, um, climate related monitoring program works on. Um, and, you know, it's something that, that is, is being looked at for some of the more private networks. Uh, and then data services. Um, so this goes to kind of a programmatic or programming access to um, the data sets that we have. And I'll, I'll show you a couple ways of doing that um, through our data sets. I'm not gonna go into great detail because I know um, not everyone here is a programmer, so, um, but we do have that ability. So to start with, um, just go to the basic of weather observational data that we have. And I'm gonna flip over um, to the web here and just do a quick walkthrough of this portal to show you what you can do. All right. Um, so yeah, when you go to this web page, which is in my presentation, um, but it's if you just go to our civicclimate.org and um, look at uh, data portals, I think, and station data, you'll you'll make your way here. And uh, to start with, you see this map of um, British Columbia, and all the little triangles are places where there, there is data, uh, there are data in the province. And if you look to the right, there's kind of a summary of what data is there. Um, so it says there's 6,822 6, locations that collect data. Uh, there's more than half a billion observations. Um, and there's also quite a few long-term station climatologies that have been calculated with this data. And you can go through the um, filter options to select the date range that you're interested in. Um, so you can enter the date. You can pick among a you know, suite of climate variables. Um, and if you, let's just say we wanna look at temperature. And when you click on it, it reduces down uh, the temperature, the stations that have temperature recorded. Um, because I, <laughs> so I did temperature mean, it's getting kind of a weird, uh, weird number. Um, there's a lot more stations that have temperature and there's, that's a better result. Um, so you can pick among the variables. Uh, you can go specifically by network. Um, so we have agriculture, um, BC Hydro, Environment Canada, um, Ministry of Environment Air Quality, for example. And then you can download that data in a variety of formats. Um, you know, NetCDF is for an advanced user. It's, it's a way to, in a compact form, access a lot of data from multiple stations. Um, but CSV and Excel are probably gonna be pretty commonly used for people. Um, yeah, and the website's up here. Um, and I think that'll be available on the recording or I don't know if we're gonna make the presentations available, but I'm happy to do so. Um, the second thing here is the prism climatology. So that was the headline of, of my talk and uh, maybe one of the most relevant things to, to um, the group here. So prism is basically a way of um, taking data at a station location or a large variety of station locations um, and distributing the information from those locations all across a landscape at a high resolution. Um, so as I showed before, there's you know 6,800 some odd places that have weather data. Um, we've used that that all those records to put together the climatology of temperature and precipitation um, for BC. Uh, we've done it now for the past two 30-year um, climate normal periods. Um, and I'll, I'll note again that those are long-term averages. So they're, they're kind of the expectation um, for monthly temperature and precipitation amount uh, over a, over a long-term period. So, you know, it gives you the information kind of like in a stationary climate, what would, what kind of things can you expect on a month to month basis? Uh, in addition to that, we've used PRISM to create a monthly time series of data. Um, and same idea, um, you take the, the climatological data or the, the mapped climatological data and use it in combination with 
month-to-month uh, -month observations of temperature and precipitation um, to give you uh, high resolution maps of temperature through time. Um, so this goes from 1950. Currently, it's to 2007. I'm in the process of updating it to the present, um, just as I'm getting data um, added onto it. Um, and then in the near future, that will be uh, built on in kind of a near real-time basis. So as we take data in, we'll make new monthly maps. Um, I'm not going to walk you through the portal there, um, but it's, it's kind of similar to the, the station data portal, uh, but you can uh, select things by area because by nature, this is a, a gridded data set. So rather than looking at single points on a map, you're looking at um, kind of big rectangles of data over a region that you're interested in. Um, and similarly, you can download it in a variety of formats. Um, for this, the NetCDF format is probably the best choice. Uh, and getting to the web-based API, um, again, this is for advanced users, um, but it is possible um, both for the station data and for the gridded data. Um, so the station data, you can, you know, at the basic level, you can download uh, complete station records. Um, and basically go back to the data portal. Um, if you click on the view metadata button, you'll get a list of all the stations. And if you download those stations, you can get the information you need to download whole records as a URL. So it's, it's basically, you know, a website that will give you, that will return all the data for that station. Um, and because it's a URL, there's a wide variety of um, programming tools that can, that can access the data in that way. Uh, it's pretty uh, language agnostic, I'd say. Uh, and likewise for the gridded data set, um, or gridded data sets, I should say. Um, same thing, there's a, an API that allows you to create a, a URL that then delivers the data to you. So for those advanced users out there, that might be a nice thing to, to be able to do. Um, so from there, just moving to data processing. Um, and you know, we do a lot of data processing in PKIC, um, but it, it sounds like this group is interested in tools um, to be able to do data processing themselves. Um, you know, quality control, uh, dealing with gaps in the data. Um, so to begin with, the data that we receive are quality controlled uh, by the individual network or uh, ministry that operates the network. Um, but that level is, is variable um, by network, uh, by time. So for example, um, the example I always use is the, there's a network operated by Flynnroard for wildfire management. And you know, their priority is to maintain their stations for the summer wildfire time, or sorry, spring into summer and fall. And they don't really make winter observations a priority. So um, if you're looking at data from that network, um, then you can expect you know, good quality data in the summer when it's important for their operations, but different quality of data in the winter. Um, and yeah, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, we're working on an initiative um, with Ministry of Agriculture to develop quality control um, for the Farm West data. And part of PKIC's ability to leverage um, is we're going to kind of use that effort to quality control um, all of the data in our data set um, at a standard that, that we set. So it'll not necessarily override the, the quality control from the other networks, but it'll, it'll be in addition to it. Um, other questions uh, regarding multiple stations in a study area, which one should I choose? Um, really depends on your application. Um, you know, if you're looking at long-term analysis, um, you may want to, you can use our data portal to filter out stations that have um, data over a long time span. Um, but if you're looking at like recent observations, then you can, you know, filter um, by more recent data. Um, and it's always possible to contact um, the operators of the networks if you have serious questions about 
about the data that you're seeing um, and whether or not it's applicable. Um, and you can always contact me as well. Um, you know, we're available to, to help you out with these kinds of questions on a, on a user basis. Uh, climate station extrapolation um, like goes straight back to PRISM. Um, and there's a large variety of interpolation techniques. Um, you know, there's stuff that we do. Um, again, we can assist you with some, some choices. Um, it's, a little, it's a pretty deep uh, topic to go into, so I won't dive too deep into it now. Uh, and then we make a, a variety of tools available uh, on the web. Uh, we operate as open source as we possibly can. Um, some of our tools are proprietary. Um, not that we have developed them as such, but because um, they were given to us in a, in a way that doesn't allow us to share. Um, but most of the analysis tools um, that we have are available either directly from our website um, and more and more through GitHub. Um, you know, the stuff you find on GitHub is often under active development, so you, <laughs> you may or may not be able to expect um, you know, a high level of completeness, but um, the tools are available and we're always willing to allow people to, to fork our code. Um, and moving ahead uh, to finding answers, um, I think uh, best practice for calculating growing degree days, uh, use Stephanie's website. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's something I can't, I can't necessarily answer directly, but um, I think it's a question you can get answered from this group. Uh, how has the growing season in BC affected, generally speaking? Um, so I'm going to flip back to the web here. So we did some um, climate indicator uh, trend analysis for uh, the Ministry of Environment. They operate a website uh, called Environmental Reporting BC, I believe. Um, yeah, Environmental Reporting BC. And you can begin to glean an answer on changes to growing season in a, in a pretty crude way. Um, through this tool, and it's just just looking at trends in temperature, um, you know, given in degrees per century over various regions in BC. So in, in this case, these are eco provinces. Uh, so if you click on a region, uh, this box and whisker plot responds. And so in the northeast of BC, you can see, not surprisingly, winter temperatures are rising very fast. Um, but there's some significant change in spring as well. Um, so warmer winter, warmer spring kind of leads you to believe that, that at least temperature wise, the growing season is expanding in the north. And if you go down to the, you know, this is called the Georgia Depression, the east side of Vancouver Island and the lower mainland, uh, you actually see much weaker trends here. We're heavily influenced by the Pacific Oceans, which um, is a lot more thermal inertia, so it doesn't warm quite as quickly. Um, you can see, you know, a little bit of warming in the winter, um, a little bit in the spring, but you know, maybe a less of an effect on the growing season here. So that's one, you know, crude tool. I strongly encourage you to to dive deeper into that. Um, Okay, and we do have some questions coming through the Q&A, and we do want to make sure there's time for you to answer some of those as well. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm just about done. Um, so additional things we have are kind of looking at the current um, weather anomalies. Uh, so we have a couple tools for that, an interactive tool, and also a set of um, static products that show station by station how the you know, temperature rainfall differed from normal and on a regional basis, um, how things differed from normal on a month by month. Yeah, so um, I'll just let you read the conclusions so we can get to some of the questions here. Okay, um, so while people are reading conclusions, I'm also going to throw up a poll and then get to some of the questions that people have. Um, so the first poll that, or the first question um, that had come in was, do you have the data set you recommend for estimating historical or watershed-based precipitation? 
Yeah, um, I think Aurelia is probably going to give you a better um, answer. But yes, at PKIC we do. We have um, both through the graded monthly prism, um, but also through the the data set that Aurelia has put together, which is what they use to force their hydrologic model. Um, you should be able to to grab the data to do that. Okay. And another question um, about how PRISM compares to Climate BC. That's, um, yeah, you're familiar with the Climate BC tool. Yeah, I meant to mention that in there. Um, so Climate BC is based on PRISM. Um, so if you, if you look at a map of Climate BC data, um, all the spatial detail that you see is from the prism climatologies. Um, so it's it's basically climate BC is is a added layer on top of uh, prism climatology, um, using a you know a, an interpolation scheme, um, you know that that has its benefits in that it's it's fairly simple to calculate. Um, but if you're curious about things like extremes or other um, kind of more detailed questions, you may want to look at um, other kinds of downscaling to get those answers. Great. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there so we have enough time for Aurelia and some of the questions that can come after um, Aurelia's presentation. Um, but thanks to everyone who wrote in those questions and we'll hand it over to Aurelia and again as we continue um, with this, please do continue to put your questions in the question and answer box and uh, we'll be able to get to them. There's some that have been coming up that we haven't got to. I've made some note of those and if we have time at the end for a little bit more of a, a, a discussion, then we'll absolutely get to that. But we want to make sure we give enough time for Aurelia to do her presentation. So over to you, Aurelia. Hi everyone, it just took me a second to find the unmute button. So thanks for having me and it's been great to hear from Stephanie and Farron and um, hear more about those tools that I don't know that much about. And um, I, yeah, so my name is Aurelia and I, I'm here to talk about the hydrologic data, data portals at PKIC. And this is not working. Okay, okay. So Farron gave a great background on PKIC, um, so I won't spend a lot of time, but just that we're a regional climate service center at the University of Victoria, and we try to provide practical information for looking at the physical impacts of climate variability and change in the Pacific and Yukon region of Canada. Um, and I work in the hydrologic impacts theme, and so we wanna give information that would be relevant for water resource management. So the overview of my talk is that, or the outline is that I wanna give an overview of the modeling study that is being um, used to produce the data for the data portal. Um, so talking about what the sources of uncertainty are in the hydrologic projections and um, the two data portals, I'll, I'll show those to you. Um, so I couldn't see Kari. Okay, so, so everyone can, everything's fine? <laughs> okay, good, thanks. Um, so then I'm going to look at an example analysis of some of the station hydrologic model output and then talk a little bit about the hydrologic impacts theme, some of the current projects. Um, and so here we go. So this is the domain. So basically we work on the watersheds that flow in and out of the province of British Columbia. And so we don't necessarily stay within the provincial borders. And the, the study that has been conducted in order to produce the data for the data portal um, is, this is the, the overview slide for that. And so when you do hydrologic model projections, you need to set up your hydrologic model. You need to parameterize it and then and calibrate it to observations. And then on the right hand side, um, we have the stuff where we look at what does what happens with hydrology with different climate futures. 
Um, so to talk a bit about the model calibration. So we're using a new model, um, well, a new version of an old model. So the vari variable infiltration capacity model, VIC, um, we added a glacier component to it. And then we created a gridded meteorological data set called PNWNA Met. And this actually has the PRISM climatology embedded into it. And because of that, it has a better representation of precipitation in the, especially the mountainous areas of, of BC. Um, and so we've used that at a as a basis for all of this modeling. So to calibrate the hydrologic model, and then also to calibrate our statistical downscaling. So we can use that reference simulation. So when we run VIC with PNWNA met with our calibrated model, then this is the Chilliwack River better crossing. Um, and the black line is the observations and the red line is the model simulations. And we can see that we're doing a pretty good job, especially of the freshet and the, the following into the summer. Um, we have a little bit of challenge in the winter period, and this is, is common um, that you underestimate winter flows with hydrologic modeling, and there's a few reasons for that. But, but so this is one way we can verify um, and that we feel like we have, it's reasonable that we use this hydrologic model to look at future changes. So how is our future projections, how are they set up? So we wanted to look at a range of uncertainty. And so we're looking at two different representative concentration pathways from the CMIP5, pardon me, CMIP5 ensemble. Um, so that was the latest version of the global climate models that were available when we did this work. And so we picked two, one that stabilizes mid-century, RCP 4.5. You can see the light blue line kind of going horizontally out into the future. And then we use RCP 8.5, and that has um, more economic activity that leads to more carbon emissions um, and then results in more temperature increase, so the red line. So we kind of bound our, our future with this moderate and more extreme scenario. And then we picked multiple global climate models. So from the CMIP-5, so this, this fifth um, model intercomparison project, um, we didn't see a decrease in the range of futures that you get from global climate models. So you get different temperature and precipitation changes depending on, on the model. So if we look here where I'm showing the results, um, well, the changes for the 2050s in the top and then the 2080s on the bottom. And the models that we pick, so just six of them, and that it covers a lot of the range. Um, so if you look at the red dots or the red letters, that's the RCP 8.5. And you can see increases from four to, uh, to more than eight degrees in summer. And precipitation increases up to 20% down to de decreases of more than 40%. And so when we're looking at water use allocation or questions around water supply, then we need to take into consideration that, that we can't tell you it's gonna be 20% or 40%, there's a, there's a range. And so I'm putting this, these temperature and precipitation values into our hydrologic model to come up with the hydrologic model uh, projections. So here we, yeah, so, so we have the two RCPs, the six GCMs, and we have the statistical downscaling technique that is refined and supposed to work well for climate extremes and hydrologic extremes. And then we have the new hydrologic model, and then we have 12 future scenarios and one reference simulation. And so over this domain, so far we have results for the Peace, Fraser, and the Columbia. And this is what the gridded um, hydrologic model data portal looks like. And I want to th say thank you to Lee, who I think is on the call. And so our computational support group at PCIC is really the, the group that gets this data up on these portals and makes them accessible. And it's a huge amount of data and it's a complicated problem to solve. So, so we're lucky that we have um, great people working on that. Um, so if we had if we looked at the fluxes that are available, we have 13 fluxes. Um, 
just looking at my time here. And so we have things from base flow to evapotranspiration, um, glacier runoff, snow, snow melt, um, soil moisture. For this, this region that we have here, we have that for our reference simulation and then one for each of the hydrologic model projections. And I'm not gonna go to this data portal today, um, but I'm gonna say that you can access the, the data is NetCDF, ASCII, ARCINFO, ASCII grids. And so this is the link there. Um, you can also look at that gridded data using things like OpenDAP. And I think I'm saying that right. I don't have a lot of experience with OpenDAP. Um, but the, there's a user docs. If you go to this link here, then there's a lot of tips there for writing scripts to extract the data. I keep clicking my page down button, which doesn't work. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk more about when we take the gridded runoff and base flow from our VIC simulation, so what we saw on the previous page, and we run it through our VIC, our, our routing, and we come up with routed stream flow. So we've calibrated the VIC model to about 120 sites in the province, in the, in, well, actually outside as well, so the Peace, the Fraser, and the Columbia, and these are all of those sites, and you can access data at each of these sites by going to this portal. Is it gonna go? It's a little bit slow, but there we are. So, so if we go to the website, this is what we call the landing page. It gives you the background that I've kind of explained already. And it tells you things like, if you wanna look at the change in the future, then we would recommend that you take one of the, the simulations and compare the future to the past for the same for the same simulation. Um, and so then you would go to the portal like so, which I, you saw on the slide. Here I'm just gonna, you can type in the name of a station if you wanna, if you know a site. Um, I'm using the Chilliwack as an example. So the Chilliwack, or you can just click, you can hover over and you can select. And then once you have something here, then you click that and it downloads a file which is about 10 megabytes. And so that's like so. So this slide is, I know you can't really read these small numbers here, but say if I brought that file that I downloaded into ASCII, this is what it would look like. So it would have the date. So it's daily stream flow from 1945 to 2012 for PNW and AMET, and then 1945 to 2099, for the, for the GCMs and then there's these different GCMs and the RCP scenarios. So we have Access 1, CAN ESM, HADGEM, the, so the six GCMs we've selected and then each of them for the two different RCPs. So this is an example of how I would look at that data. So plotting it as a hydrograph I'm looking at just this, the six member ensemble for RCP 4.5. And I'm, so the black line is, is the 1980s. So the 30 year period from 1971 to 2000. This is kind of what the Chilliwack River looks like. Um, and then as we go out into the future into different 30 year periods, um, the 2020s to 2080s, we can see that with increasing temperature, we're getting a reduced peak flow. Um, we're getting things stretching out kind of more over the year, more water coming earlier in the year, in the fall and in the winter, it running off. And so that makes sense in a warmer world, we have less snow and more rain. And so similar picture in with the RCP 8.5, except that it's more extreme. By the 1980s, we have almost a rainfall dominated um, type kind of regime in this basin. So does that kind of strike a chord when you're looking at agriculture or water use allocation? Maybe. Maybe it does. So then another thing we can ask are, um, is do the GCMs agree in terms of the direction of change? So here are the different seasonal values from the different GCMs. The, 
RCP ensemble 4.5 on the blue and 8.5 in the orange. And we can see agreement that all of the GCMs in the 2050s and 2080s, they agree that there, there's going to be an increase in spring, a decrease in summer, an increase in fall, increase in winter. But the annual, it's kind of on the fence. There's some models that project increase and some project a decrease. So by looking at the, the different members of the ensemble, we can get a picture of the direction, the consensus, and um, that gives us some confidence in the, in the projections. And here's, here's the values in a table. So something like in the spring by the 2050s, we could have a 20-ish percent increase, the summer about a 30% decrease, fall uh, like 10 to 20, depending on RCP, and the winter more from 70 um, to 100%. So remember that the winter values are quite low. So as a percentage, it's a fairly large change. And the annually, it's around 10% and increasing kind of more out into the future, which makes sense with a warming atmosphere that we just get more precipitation. So those are, that's the overall study design that we use to create the data. Here you can get the PNW name met the end, and two other gridded daily um, meteorological data sets. Um, you can get the statistical downscaling, so the temperature and precipitation that you, is used to force um, the hydrologic simulations. Um, and then the gridded hydrologic model output, the station hydrologic model output. Then PKIC, what are we working on? We're looking at some large ensembles. So for the same GCM, multiple runs, um, and that tells you more about natural variability and how, how it, the natural variability of, of the climate. Um, we're also working on applying VIC to the coastal basins where I showed on the map, we hadn't really gotten there yet. So we're starting to work on those. And then we're adding water temperature to VIC and so we can look at water temperature changes in those basins and then in the Nechaco, that's another area. We're also comparing our calibration procedure to other um, large model calibration procedures because we have a kind of a novel approach. Um, and so we're contributing to the, the scientific community there. And then we're, we're bringing a different model online, Raven, which is better for smaller watersheds and um, we're uh, adding glacier model component to that. We're initially applying it in the mica and Shechemus, and then starting to work in the SOMAS, which is on Vancouver Island. And there we're gonna add water temperature modeling. And then we're planning to develop more of a, a tool, so as opposed to a portal where you just get raw data, the tool would allow us to access any of the points within the area where we have hydrologic model results so that you could route it to something that I, in the, beyond the points that I've shown you. So anywhere in the grid. And so just, yeah, as a teaser for, for Kari's presentation on uh, June 24th, we have the Climate Explorer at PKIC and Plan to Adapt, and that's more related to temperature and precipitation changes. The Climate Explorer allows you to um, extract and compare from different models for different variables. I think there is stuff there on, for example, growing degree days. Plan to adapt is a kind of a more synthesized, um, parsed um, by, by region um, and um, kind of average temperature changes over a region um, and with some indicators for different sectors. So, uh, so I'll stop it there. Thanks for listening. Um, and if you have any questions, I think there's still some time. Yeah, so I'm going to launch the poll for people just to think about um, how and if you would use this hydrological data portals, um, useful to us to just see. And as you're thinking about that, please keep adding questions to the Q&A box for Aurelia. If we have time, there's some questions we didn't get to that we'll loop back to for other presenters as well and a couple of things that people noted uh, for or that I've noted from people for discussion. So just um, sort of the first thing Aurelia, um, what are the six GCMs used in the VIC GL and how were they chosen? 
Yeah, so the six GCMs are listed here. Sorry, it's not the best way to read them. So they're Access One, CANESM, CCC, CCSM4, CNRM, CM5, and HADGEM, and, and, and actually MPI as well here. And so how they were chosen is was, was with, um, it was an objective method primarily that wanted to, uh, so Alex Cannon developed this method where you could look at the, the most range that you could get out of the full CMIP5 ensemble for climate extremes. And so we wanted to pick the at least six of those because we could get the widest range in the, in the, most, uh, the most GCMs. And so, yeah, and then some of them kind of align with other studies for regional climate modeling. And these are a subset of the PKIC-12 that um, the Regional Climate Impacts Group at PKIC has, has used and produced downscale data for as well. Great, thanks. Um, also have a question, have you generated gridded maps of water infiltration through soil from the VIC model that may be used as a recharge for regional groundwater models? And does the VIC model consider interactions between surface water and groundwater? Yeah, so we don't have those maps. And so we, we don't, the groundwater isn't represented in the, the VIC model. So we have what we call base flow and the, the VIC model actually operates on an individual grid cell. And so each grid cell is one sixteenth of a degree, um, which is about five kilometers aside roughly. And those cells don't talk to each other. So we don't have a good representation of the slow, uh, slow flow, flow that comes from interconnections over long or over, I guess, large spatial scales. Um, yeah, so that is part of the problem when we're, we're modeling the low flow part of the, the hydrograph. Great. Um, so we do have a few questions for some other people that had come up that we didn't quite get back to. Thank you very much, Aurelia. I'll keep checking for, um, for questions and I'll try as any further questions come in to direct them to my guests for the best person to talk to. Um, one of the thing that a couple of people had asked as a question, I think for you, Stephanie, which was um, how can, or is it possible or how can people get access to soil data, data for the irrigation demand model? And I actually answered that question in the okay. uh, Q&A. Uh, there is a link to the BC Soil Information Finder tool that's uh, managed by Ministry of Environment. That's the uh, data that we put into the agriculture water demand model. And the link is included in the answer I uh, put in. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. So got a record for that. Um, Farron, there was a question about the um, spatial and temporal resolution of PRISM. Just what is the spatial and temporal resolution of PRISM? I just kind of shot a link out to the landing page for PRISM, but a succinct answer um, could be useful for folks too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the spatial resolution is roughly 800 meters. Um, it's 30 arc seconds. So it's in lot lawn uh, grid. And the temporal resolution, um, so there's, there's prism climatology, which are just long-term averages of the individual months as well as the year. Um, so those, don't, I guess they have a monthly resolution, but they're really just a set of 12 maps per variable or 13 maps per variable. And the prism monthlies are at a monthly resolution. Um, and prism dailies are on our radar. Um, I'm not going to promise them yet, but that's something that we'll, we'll eventually get to. Okay, thank you. And then I'm actually going to shoot a question at Shauna from, <laughs> from participants. There was a question and I had just um, also just posted a link to the CAI website, but there was a question about whether or not there were examples of people using um, data from these data sites and in particular climate change data for making different decisions. So I thought I would set you up to talk a little bit more about ACARN. 
Yeah, um, there are some examples um, of individual researchers using this type of data and also it being used in the decision aid support tools. So Stephanie Tam had given an example of um, the decision aid support tool that's being used um, for tree fruit producers. And that was a project that um, was supported in part by the Climate Action Initiative. So that link that Kari shared. Um, and in that, that work that Climate Action Initiative is doing, um, they're first building from the climate projections using PKIC information, and then um, identifying priorities for projects. And some of those are you know, going on to use um, weather station data in different ways, and also supporting an increase in weather station um, uh, weather station networks and addressing some of the issues to increase coverage and um, data usability. So there's many examples. Um, maybe one other further example I'll give where there's been a lot of talk um, in ACARN and excitement for how this data could be used for future, uh, future crop suitability modeling. Um, and some of that work is going on at Agricultural and Agri-Food Canada in Summerland. And, um, we'll probably be looking at that in one of the future webinars in this series, along with the DAS tool. So those more specific examples will be coming. So great to hear those questions. Great, thanks. Uh, so I also have a question from Chelsea, um, if we could share the link to the document that instructs folks on how to download gridded data. Um, I've had access trouble accessing it in the past, may have been on the slide, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure who that's directed to, Chelsea. If you wanted to just add um, some clarification in the chat box, that would be fine. And I think someone can probably get to that. Aurelia, okay, thanks, Chelsea. So Aurelia, the, I think you did have a link in your presentation about instructions on how to download gridded data, correct? Uh, so yeah, so I had a link to the the gridded hydrologic model output da data, yeah, to the landing page, which takes you to the data portal. And there are, um, yeah, I didn't go through, I didn't give an example of how to, how to do it. Um, and but there are the user docs. Um, so there's a link at the top left corner when you're on the data portal, which should give you some answer some of your questions and then if you have more questions how about um, you can direct them to me and then I can uh, yeah start to work with Lee on how to maybe better describe things so it, it helps everyone yeah I'll, I'll add that that's a it's I think it's it's something that we who generate the data don't know a ton about um, but we, we can definitely point to the people that can give you as much detail as you need to, to get that information. Okay, thank you very much. There is one question that I'm so close to losing and I, that, that isn't really directed to anyone, but um, wait, uh, do any of us on the panel know if there's any plans to generate downscale bioclimatic data for BC similar to WorldClim? Um, so I don't know if any of us know anyone who's, I know there's been some work on the, on the Beck zones and I don't know if that's related. Um, but I, I don't know specifically who knows more about that. I don't know if any of you do. I, I have a, I think, um, the new person, um, that replaced Dave Spittlehouse mm. in the Flynn Road ministry, um, Colin Colin Mahoney yes uh, he has a strong interest in that um, he's a he's done a lot of work with high resolution climate modeling um, and forest like changes in forest ecosystems uh, with climate change um, so he's he's kind of working on that stuff but Colin Mahoney at Flynn Roard um, and let us know if you need an email or something we can we can pass that on and thank you, Dave Spittlehost. We mention you and you make a comment. I appreciate it. If that, if that happened all the time in my life when you come up, Dave, I would appreciate it. But um, you just sent a note saying Climate BC does generate some bioclimatic data. So hopefully that helps um, for Julie. So we're really close to end time. Um, Shab Chabti, I'm 
mispronouncing your name and I apologize for that. Um, also had another question for Farron that I think is a little bit more substantive than he'll be able to answer in this moment. So I'm gonna reframe it to say, Farron, are there resources or papers that you could um, direct Shabti to? And I think she says overall process, specific method, all, methods used different for different weather stations and depending on who runs them. This feels like a follow-up to another question, but I don't, I've lost track of what the first one was. So overall process, what specific methods are used, different for different, are they different for different weather stations and depending on who, who runs them, precipitation versus temperature, what is the correction delay, is information annotated, <laughs> more information, where can Shabti Bitmen go? Yeah, uh, yeah, um, I answered Shabtai in private, but I'll, I'll mention it here. Um, uh, so we're we're using a process um, that the U.S. Um, National Weather Service uses for their homogenized climate data, um, and there's a paper for that. And I'd be happy to I'll send along to Shabtai, but I can pass along to anybody else that's interested. Um, and then we're it's focused on daily data, but it's um, we're adapting it to uh, higher resolution data as well. Um, specific techniques are you know, both looking at a single station's statistics, but also using surrounding stations to help us decide whether or not a given observation is, is out of line. Um, and what was the last part of that question <laughs> missing? But um, anyway, that data is available and it's, it's also work that we're gonna do with, with Ministry of Agriculture um, to help with, with uh, Farm West data quality. I hope that answers your question more or less. That's great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today and a huge thank you to our three panelists and to our co-host Kari. Um, I'd say that for our first webinar, this is, was a great start and uh, it's great to see so many um, engaged participants with great questions. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the recording will be available to all the registrants and we also will be posting this as part of a new resource guide for weather and climate data for agricultural adaptation that will be going on the bcacarn.com website. Um, and I hope you will join us, and thank you, Aurelia, for including this in your presentation. Join us for our next webinar on June 24th, we'll, where we will be diving into those um, climate modeling analysis tools. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot. Um, if you have further feedback and questions, please feel free to reach out to me. And once you close, there will be a quick pop-up survey with four questions, and it would be a huge help to us if you just took a few minutes to fill that out. Thanks a lot.